Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zena Hazam. I'm the executive director of the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. On behalf of the, the fund's board and staff, I'd like to welcome you to our annual Hisham Sharabi Memorial Lecture. A special welcome goes to Dr. Salim Tamari, who is our distinguished lecturer today. We're so pleased to have you with us. This memorial lecture is named after Professor Hisham Sharabi, who was one of the co-founders of our organization the Jerusalem Fund for Education and Community Development. Dr. Sharabi served as the chairman of our board of directors from 1977 when the fund was founded until his death in 2005. Through this annual event, we honor the memory and the vast body of work of Hisham Sharabi. From 1953 to 1998, that's for 45 years, he was professor of European intellectual history at Georgetown University, where he also held the Omar al-Mukhtar Chair of Arab Culture. Dr. Sharabi was also one of the founders in 1975 of Georgetown Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, one of the premier institutions of its kind in the United States. Hisham Sharabi was from Jaffa, which is also where Tam Salim Tamari is from. In 1998, Sharabi wrote, In Jaffa, one of my favorite places as a small boy was the city's ancient harbor. I visited the harbor when I went back in the fall of 1993. Standing where I often stood from so many years ago, I felt only the bitterness and the anger all Palestinians feel when they go back to where they are born and where their grandparents were born and spend their lives before becoming refugees, and spent their lives before becoming refugees. I try to remind myself of what sustained all Palestinian refugees over the long years of exile. This land is not a memory. It is not lost. It is out there where it can be seen and touched, a patrimony that can never be given up nor taken away." Unquote. Today, Salim Tamari will be talking to us about a city that is pivotal in the Palestinians' history and memory and current life, Jerusalem. Through Tamari's vast research and exploration of the writings of Wasif Jauhariye in the first half of the 20th century, we learn about the vibrant and often unknown history of this city, from religious celebrations to music and theater performances and literary ca cafes. With Hissam Nassar, Dr. Tamari has compiled and edited these memoirs as a book titled, The Storyteller of Jerusalem, The Life and Times of Wasif Jauhariye, 1904-1948. He will also look at the city in the present time and discuss its future. You will actually have an opportunity to purchase this book at the end of the lecture in our boardroom. We'll also have a question and discussion period at the end our live stream audience can send questions via Twitter on at Palestine Center. Also, those online and in our audience can join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag HSML15. That's Hisham Sharabi Memorial Lecture, HSML15. So let me now introduce our speaker more fully. Salim Tamari is Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Birzeit University where he has taught since 1971. His distinguished teaching and scholarly career has included posts at Harvard, Georgetown, Columbia, UC Berkeley, MIT, NYU, Cornell, Bogazici University in Istanbul, and the University of Venice, Karl Foscari. He has served <coughs> as director of the Institute of Dr Jerusalem Studies since 1994 and is the editor of Jerusalem Quarterly. Dr. Tamari is the author of a multitude of works on urban culture, political sociology, biography and social history, and social history, sorry, of the Eastern Mediterranean. In addition to the book I mentioned, The Storyteller of Jerusalem, he's the author of Jerusalem 1948, Al-Quds al-Uthmaniya, Ottoman Jerusalem, Mandate Jerusalem in the Memoirs of Wasif Jauhariye, and this is with Isam Nassar, and Year of the Locust, Palestine and Syria during World War I. 
He's the editor of Pilgrims, Lepers, and Stuffed Cabbage, Essays on the Cultural History of Ottoman and Mandate Jerusalem, Biography and Social History of Bilad al-Sham, which is edited by Reis with Nassar, The Mountain Against the Sea, Ihsan's War, The Intimate Life of an Ottoman Soldier, and Family Papers, Studies in the Contemporary Social History of Palestine, edited with Nassar and Muhammad. The renowned Palestinian professor and scholar Rashid Khalidi describes Salim Tamari as the preeminent Palestinian historical sociologist. Dr. Tamari's talk is titled Jerusalem, the Holy, the Unholy, the Mundane, and the Future of the City. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you, Zena. I, you should not always read my CV in introducing me. <laughs> That's where we exaggerate our achievements. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Zena Azam and Samira Qasim for having me here today, uh, especially in the name of a dear uh, scholar and friend, Hisham Sharabi. Um, Hisham actually had a problematic history with Jerusalem. He was a Jaffa and Akka man, and in his memoirs, Al Jamru al Ramad, there are very peripheral but almost negative references to Jerusalem. I say this not to debase his memoirs, on the contrary, be, but to emphasize this historical uh, dynamic between coastal people and uh, mountain people, which I've been uh, talking about. And this is indeed one theme that we'll be addressing today. Uh, in my talk today, I will be examining several themes about Johari's Jerusalem and the way he uh, questioned the problematic modernity of the city and recast it in a new light, and then move on to discuss the issue of sacredness and syncretic religion, which is very much part of his chronicle of the city and see how these debates about religiosity, sacredness, and what the anthropologists called syncrety of religious life have become problematic features of the search for the future of Jerusalem. One uh, area which I would like to introduce in my talk today is an examination of the city's properties and endowments which the Institute for Palestine Studies have been working on and which uh, uh, Professor Munir Fakhreddin and I have been working on for the last year. And it addresses the question of awqaf, both family endowments and religious public endowments. And I want to address how these issues of um, property uh, divisions in the city have and will affect our way of looking at the city's future in the context of the debacle and paralysis that the city has been suffering from in its uh, political negotiations and future. So this is basically a summary of what I'm going to talk about. You can leave now if, if, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to hear more details. <laughs> Um, one feature of the city which Johari talks about is the intermingling of the city as a metaphor and the reality of the city. And the city as metaphor is exemplified by the way in which longings, attachments, uh, distant remaking and imagination of the city have worked in the minds of many writers, including um, Her, uh, Herman Melville, Mark Twain, who I'll be talking about in a minute, always recasting the city in a very idyllic form and sometimes in a not rather positive form, being a city of sacredness, and uh, being shocked at the encounter with the city. Because the real city, to many of these pilgrims and writers and poets, was so sacred that the uh, smells and feelings of the mundane city have always produced a shock of arrival. 
And one epitome of this epitome, I, I should say, of this uh, encounter is the issue known as the Jerusalem Syndrome, which is a kind of hallucination people feel around Easter time when the city is flooded or visited by uh, pilgrims who think they are the Messiah and they are coming to redeem not only the city but the whole uh, humanity from its ills. Uh, there is in fact a special unit of the police force uh, that, that is the Israeli police force whose task is to intercept uh, people who suffer from the Jerusalem syndrome before they can do much damage. The city as an image and the city in reality is very much exemplified by the story of uh, Khalil Sakakin and his marriage in 1913 to Sultana Abdo. The story is told by many people, but the most uh, uh, funniest and the most satirical rendition of the story is by uh, Isa al Isa, the editor of Palestine, in his memoirs, not yet published. In any case, uh, Khalil Sakakini spent many years waiting to get married to Sultana Abdo, mostly by virtue of uh, lack of funding. Eventually he decides and the uh, priesthood bans him from the marriage because uh, ostensibly they discovered that they are related to the fifth degree, which was a ruse because the Orthodox have a habit of managing banned uh, religious ceremonies, but in his case, his uh, nationalist involvement with the, uh, against the ecclesiastical hierarchy was the real reason. So he goes to Jaffa where the marriage is arranged and successfully concluded. And this, in the rendition of both Sakakin and Isa, uh, is a reflection about the two cities, the libertine, open-minded, liberal, uh, culturally rich uh, domain of Jaffa against the conservative puritanical life of the city of Jerusalem. This dichotomy between Jaffa and Jerusalem or the coast and the inland cities is repeated by many people including Herman Melville, Mark Twain in Innocence Abroad, uh, Salma Akram, the daughter of Ali Akram Bey, the governor of Jerusalem from Istanbul, in her memoirs, Faleh Rifti, who was a very prominent Ottoman journalist uh, working in um, the headquarters of the Fourth Army, Omar Saleh al Barghouti, who wrote very interesting memoirs about Jerusalem called Al Marahil, Isa al Isa, I mentioned, and our own Edward Said. Edward, in Out of Place, narrates his father's and his own vision of the city emitting the odor of sacred incense and permeated with the religious puritanism and the petrified smell of death. This is a very common theme among all the writers I mentioned. On the other side, in modern Zionism, in Zionist discourse, uh, Jerusalem's stifling orthodoxy is always contrasted with Tel Aviv's European image of liberalism. And there's the, always the notion that Jerusalem is the domain of the Haldim and the Arabs while we live in Europe. <coughs> we meaning we liberal uh, the Israeli Zionists. In Wasif Johari we see a completely different modernity we see a modernity of the city that is recast from his experience as a musician, performer, and military officer in the Fourth Ottoman Army. Here we see a vibrant social life, teeming with uh, musical concerts, halls, cafes, and expanding imperial architecture and landscape. The Popular social life in the urbanscape of Jerusalem is most interestingly cast through his description of popular religious ceremonials. And here we see what the anthropologists called a syncretic religious life in which Jews, Christians, and Muslims partake in the ceremonial of the other 
in the various seasons of Ramadan, uh, Purim, a visitation to Shimon Hasidik, and heightened by the greatest day that Jerusalem witnesses every year, which is the Saturday of light before, uh, before Easter Sunday and after Good Friday. This is an Orthodox celebration which in Jerusalem becomes a national popular celebration by all religious communities. So all of these are described in extreme details, not in an idealistic uh, vision or one which reinforces a false notion of coexistence, but actually a livid city in which the mundane, the livid experience of daily life is exemplified through these syncretic rituals. Uh, on the right, you see a picture which is preserved in the Juhariya collection of a football game uh, performed in Bab al Sahri Cemetery in 1910. This is a very unique uh, experience. It's possible that there were football games bef before it, but what's unique about it is first, it's the first time it's recorded. Second, if you look at the dress codes, you'll see that Jerusalem reflects the dynamic cultural uh, hybridity of modernity of that time. You see European dress, Qumbaz, Sarawil, uh, people holding umbrellas, which in Arabic are called shamsiye, to protect it from the sun, not from the rain. There's hardly any rain there. And jovially intermixing, waiting for the, uh, uh, for the footballers to uh, commence their game. In Wasif's exposition of cultural life in the city, we see a description of some of the most interesting and stimulating uh, bohemian intellectual uh, uh, personages in Palestine at the turn of the century. We see the work of Hezb al-Salik, which is the party of the vagabonds, the circle around which uh, Khalil Sakakini uh, performed uh, his uh, poetic and uh, artistic uh, uh, products between 1908 and 1922. This was both a party, a, a, a putative party, and uh, an intellectual circle and the cafe at the same time. Tawfiq Kan'an, the uh, dermatologist and folklorist, and his circle who published their works in the Journal of Palestine Oriental Society. Bendeli Juzi, who wrote The Origins of Islam from a Marxist perspective and created a great deal of controversy at the time. A book which probably will be banned today <laughs> if it's published, but it was widely circulating in Jerusalem at the time. Uh, the work of Yusuf al-Isa and his literary newspaper Al-Asma'i uh, and most importantly, the, the dawn of publishing through the work of George Habib Hananiya and Al-Quds newspaper, which was published between 1908 and 1914. We also see a, a renaissance of educational achievements through uh, the work of uh, uh, Dar al-Ma'arif and Muhammad Saleh, and especially the work of Khalil Sakakini, this man here, and his innovative experimental school, Al Dusturiya College. And of course, all of them were men. In Johariya's rendition of the city, we note that the basic unit uh, describing the habitat of the city was the Mahalla. There were 26 different neighborhoods in the old city known as the Mahalla, the plural of which is Mahallat. And this idea that uh, the city is made of four quarters is a British invention. Of course, there were always references to the Jewish quarter, the Armenian quarter, the Christian quarter. But the transformation of these Mahallat into four sectarian quarters was a British administrative imposition which started in 1921 three years after the, man, uh, after the British uh, uh, occupied uh, Jerusalem. And in that, they had deconstructed the secular 
national integrative identity, which was a product of the 1908 Constitution, into a sectarian identity in which people were now identified in their identity cards by religion, sect, uh, and uh, ethnicity. And in Juhari, we see also the conversions of religious festivals into nationalist platforms. Uh, the whole issue of syncretic religiosity by which uh, Christians celebrated Ramadan, Muslims went to visit uh, the tomb of Shimon Hasidik, which was a Jewish uh, shrine in Sheikh Jarrah, and Jews uh, celebrated Sabtinur, and all of them celebrated the festivals of the others, now gave way as the Balfour Declaration and the British idea of a Jewish national home was introduced, a convergence of religious identity with a nationalist identity. So this secularization of Jerusalem as a city and its religious identity as an ethnic identity began to be felt in the 1930s. And we see it through the chronicles of uh, Juhariye, who celebrated the earlier common shared life of religious festivals through Nabi Rubin, uh, the festivals of Nabi Musa in the, in the spring, uh, and especially Sit Sitna Maryam, uh, the Virgin Mary in August, in which all people were partaking in public ceremonies. Now they began to be celebrated as nationalist religious ceremonials. Uh, on the Jewish side, we have a, a very mixed uh, a notion in which Zionism looked at Jerusalem as a medieval city and its people going to it as belonging to uh, primordial uh, religious identities from which Zionism was escaping. And this anti-clerical ideology had two great consequences. One is that Jews of the Holy Land, especially in the four holy cities, began to be slowly removed from local ethnicities and isolated from an Arab and Palestinian national identity, which through their Arabophone, through the language they belong to, into a separate ethnicity. And two, the religious esoteric ties of the Holy Land were now being translated into territorial and nationalist yearnings, while still remaining as metaphoric references, but now they, be, they were secularized and nationalized and separated the Jews from the rest of the Muslim and Christian communities. This convergence of religion with ethnicity and, and nationalism were reinforced through the 48 and 67 wars. This is not a, a history of Jerusalem, so I'm not going to go uh, over them. I just use them as markers for telling the story that Wasif cast in this period. In the Oslo Accords, which were signed 1993, the issue of Jerusalem was deferred together with the question of refugees and settlements to final status issues. That is, to six years later, in 1999, when, of course, this never happened. It was deferred almost indefinitely. Uh, the PLO's approval of a two-state formula, first in 1988 in the Palestine National Council, and the idea of one capital for two states now uh, were, was recast as two capitals for two states in one city. The idea was that West Jerusalem would be the capital of the Israeli state and East Jerusalem would become the capital of the Palestinian state. But with the conclusion of the Camp David and Taba meetings after 2000, the battle over Jerusalem shifted from question of dividing the city into two sovereignties to one in which the issue became the negotiations of Israeli disengagement from the Arab parts of the city. 
and this was a substantial um, retreat from the earlier positions about undoing the consequences of the war of 67 and the application of Security Council Resolution 242, whereby the Israelis will withdraw back to the uh, f uh, borders of June 5th in favor of creation of two territorial separate entities. It was in this period that Faisal Husseini, the minister for Jerusalem uh, under Arafat's uh, uh, leadership, suggested the Roman model as the most appropriate one for Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem, uh, sorry, Rome was seen as the only city in the world where you have two sovereign entities, but a united city um, transgressing the same territory, but divided in sovereignty, united in terms of logistic access and command. This was the agreement reached in 1929, uh, the Lateran uh, Treaty between Mussolini and the Holy See. And until today, it is seen as the only case in history where you have such a successful uh, uh, development. Of course, Mussolini is also known for making the trains run on time. So this is another <laughs> achievement for him. Uh, however, in real facts, the idea that Jerusalem is Rome uh, was uh, challenged by realities on the ground because the realities of Jerusalem is much more akin to divided Berlin or Belfast uh, before the, uh, uh, the recent developments than it is to the united and divided city of Rome. It was also introducing the notion of the holy basis as the basis for min minimalist politics. The idea of the holy basin was introduced in the 1990s by, um, uh, by social scientists, not, not Palestinian or Israeli, but by social scientists who suggested that if you minimize the area of conflict to the location of the holy places, then we can address the rest of the issues in terms of territorial disentanglement and deal with Jerusalem as the location of holiness. That is, you address the issue of sacredness as a way of resolving the issue, but only in a minimalist territorial area, which is, in the case of Jerusalem, is one square kilometer of the old city plus uh, Rachel's tomb. And there's something called the, what's it called? The uh, Grace Said, no, the, the tomb of Christ in uh, the Protestant tradition. What is it called? The garden tomb, yes. The garden tomb and Rachel's tomb would be the outer parameters of these uh, holy basin ideas. The assumption here is that once you confine the religious contestation to the sacred sites, then the territorial claims can be dealt with through notions of sovereignty and secure borders. The second assumption is that the most sacred sites are located in mutually exclusive domains. That is, what is Christian is Christian, what is Jewish is Jewish, what is Muslim is Muslim. We find a common administrative formula and everybody lives happily ever after. The following map, which was drawn by uh, the group called Ir Amin, uh, shows how this notion of exclusivity works and how it does not work, which is I'm going to address. So here we have a location of the Jewish holy sites in the city in blue, including areas claimed by uh, the, after 67, by the group known as Ateret Kohanim the settler group. And here we have the Christian holy sites in pink. I don't know why they chose pink for Christians, but here we go. And here we have the Muslim holy sites. Now what happens if you put them all together? You got Domino Pizza <laughs> with salami and olives and onions. So 
this was the idea, is although there is some overlap, but there is a possibility of disentanglement of the holy site, and therefore you can address them separately but together. That is logistically together, but separately in terms of administration. The problem with the sacred basin paradigm is that not all sites are exclusive. Um, there are areas which are contested by two or more religions. Haram Sharif, uh, Rachel's tomb, the Ibrahimi mosque in Hebron, which is known as the tomb of the patriarchs and so on. These are contested by Jews and by Muslims. Uh, then there are Muslim sites which are newly claimed by Jews, the most important of which are Nabi Rubin and Nabi Samuel on the road to Jerusalem from the north. And there are Jewish sites claimed by Muslims, such as Nabi Yaqub. And there are also putative Jewish sites that have been abandoned to the Muslims, the most important of which is the tomb of the prophet Moses, because in the Jewish tradition, Moses did not see the Holy Land. He, he died uh, in Mount Nebo, in the Jordanian site. So there is this messy entanglement of claims. And of course, you know why. Because they all are really uh, 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 the same religion with different bifurcations. So it's only natural that they would have many shared prophets, uh, saints, shrines, and claims over territory extensions of these shrines. In actual practice, uh, the Israelis have tried to preempt these disentanglements through the twin strategies of zoning and demography. Israel anticipated and preempted the Palestinian position through a series of laws and military uh, decrees um, remaking the defeated city. First, the redrawing of Greater Jerusalem in 1907 and successive adjustments to that, creating a city that's 12 times its original size before uh, 67 and the whole series of issuing residency rights with different colored IDs depending on your closeness to the Jewish state and to God. Uh, and also through demography. In 1979, a ministerial committee for Jerusalem was establi established that the ratio of Arabs and Jews in the city should not be allowed to exceed the 32 to 68 percent dividing line. And what they did is to use uh, residency permits, construction permits, and rezoning as a way of keeping this ratio more or less the same. And they have succeeded in that. So today, the ratio of Jews to Arabs in the city is one third to two thirds. Although this whole formula is being undermined daily because of the high fertility rates uh, of the Arab population. And the Jewish secret weapon in this is orthodox fertility, which is sort of trying to, like we, we procreate ourselves to victory in bed. So who does Jerusalem belong to? This is usually the classic question on which many pamphlets were written and monographs and many professors made a career in arguing this or that. Uh, the question is here, and this is the whole purpose of my, uh, the, the second part of my discussion, is that there's a difference between uh, abstract formulations which are concocted by uh, social scientists and by politicians as ideal forms of solution and what's happening on the ground and how these happening on the ground undermine these uh, 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 sort of conceptual solutions for the city. Um, the question is what happens if the issue of negotiations, sovereignty contestation fails? Well, there are people living on the ground, and these people live in their habitat, and they have daily lives, and they have contestations, and they create facts on the ground, as Nadia Abul-Hajj has suggested in her book. 
uh, she was talking about archaeology, not about politics. Uh, the western part of the city, which was uh, occupied by the Israelis in 48, in the war of 48, Palestinians still own 70% of the property. Of course, this is theoretical ownership because they have the title deeds, but they do not have access to these properties. Of those 40%, of those 70%, 40% are waqf endowments, mostly belonging to religious associations. What I'm going to suggest now is the same kind of uh, assessment of the situation in the historic old city. This is the work that IPS have been working on. And uh, the significance of the waqf is very crucial to understand how the question of sovereignty and political contestation is separate from the question of tenancies, properties, estates, and endowments. Uh, this map, and I take it you all can read Arabic, <laughs> but I'll help you. Uh, you can see a very interesting distribution. So state properties in Jerusalem is 3.9%. The municipality of Jerusalem owns 0.3% of the old city. The Jewish property, as, uh, as left in the War of 48, constitute 2%, 1.9% of the city's property. Islamic Waqf is 6.8%. Family Waqf, which is called Dirri in Arabic, is 15.8%. Christian Waqf is 44.2% of the total territory of real estate in the city of Jerusalem. And the rest is private property, which is 27%. Now, in the whole contestation over buying land, which Abdelat Kohanim and all the, um, the Jewish nationalist religious groups are contesting, there are two ways of appropriating these properties. One, through outright confiscation of what they call absentees, people who have left the city or were expelled from it, and their property is claimed. And the other, through purchase, through a number of uh, ways. Of course, there's a third way, which has been occurring more frequently, which is faking documents of absentee also and uh, uh, creating uh, uh, illusionary sales. But what matters here is that all this contestation can only happen over 27% of the property. The rest is waqf or public or communal or family waqf. Now, what's interesting about waqf is that it cannot be bought, it cannot be sold, it cannot be transferred, it cannot be liquidated. It's an eternally established endowment which can be in a person's name, in a family uh, name, or as public endowment, as a school, hospital, um, a public bath, uh, or public institutions. So it's indivisible, it cannot be liquidated. And this is extremely significant to understand why the city of Jerusalem cannot be overtaken in terms of possession as it has been taken in terms of legal, military, administrative laws introduced by the State of Israel. Family and public waqf endowments ensure the protection and preservation of the Arab holdings in the city, which constitute 51% in the public domain, 16% in the family domains, and this is significance of Christian um, Orthodox, especially Orthodox, but also Catholic, and much less uh, other denominations property. It is 44% of the total uh, uh, real estate in, in the city. And I mentioned 40% in the Western city is owned by the Orthodox uh, uh, Church alone. Now, the Orthodox Church is not exactly Arab as you know, but it is a Palestinian church. And that is why you have such a degree of pressure, polemics, and controversy about the 
uh, property of the church and the pressure on it to yield uh, its property to Israeli ownership. And the only success story which has happened was to grant 99-year uh, leases, uh, which sounds like a long time, but in the case of the Muscovia, of the uh, Russian compound, for example, that 99 years have come to an end uh, three years ago, and uh, Mr. Putin was around to claim it. And now the Russian state, because this is Russian Orthodox property, speaking of, uh, on behalf of Christ, and the Russian Orthodox Church has may have successfully claimed it and got it back. So now it's uh, in Russian Orthodox uh, and presumably state land uh, hands. So my time has come. Yeah, five, five minutes, four minutes, four and a half. So. In attempting to address the future of the city, we have discussed models, paradigms, and all of them attempt to address the issue, usually resolved through equitable negotiations. This is the case in Nicosia, Berlin, Belfast. So even though there was a weaker party, a stronger party, nevertheless, the rule of law and equity and international intervention made sure that these negotiations between weaker part, stronger party ended up in creating a consensual solution for Nicosia, Berlin. Nicosia is, is on its way of being resolved, but nevertheless, substantial progress has been ha had. Belfast and so on. Such models do not seem to apply in the case of Jerusalem because of the unevenness of the contestation of power between the Israel and the Palestinians. The reason is because here we have what I consider a purely colonial uh, situation of unevenness, which is camouflaged through religious claims, sacredness, uh, common, uh, descend, uh, common uh, living habitat, and so on. And if we restore the naked conflict to its colonial paradigm, I think we open our eyes to see these solutions in a much more proper manner. So only through addressing these issues of conflict, contestation, demographic control, uh, uh, within this uneven situation can we begin actually to understand why these idealistic solutions do not operate, have not succeeded so far. And the point of this debate, which I was trying to uh, introduce here, is that regardless of what happens in the process of negotiations and this unevenness, there are small battles being fought, which are over the issue of residency, demography, zoning, occupancy, and the future of endowments, which may ultimately determine the future of the city much more than politics. Thank you. limits the power of the Israeli state to confiscate the walks? What complicates it? No, what limits their power? Oh, what limits you it? You seem secure that they can't do it Yeah. without explaining. Because waqf is registered in the title deed as a public endowments, or in the case of family waqf as private uh, family endowments in the name of the lineages for time immemorial. In other words, the lineages of the family continue to control the waqf through what is known as mutwalli. This is the keeper of the waqf, and that keeper is elected by the family every generation or every few years. What, uh, what stops this is the death of every single member of that family. And that happens, and there are provisions for the transfer of the waqf to the public domain. It becomes a, a public charity in that case. So even then, even if every single member of the Nusebis or the, I don't want to mention the Janis because they are here. Uh, 
uh, if, if like if every member of that family disappears then the state still cannot control it it, it goes to public charity and that limits the disposition of waqf property yeah Actually, it's a good question because in Israel itself, they have not. The, in, in the Israeli state, Islamic Waqf was considered an archaic institution, and uh, many Islamic Waqf institutions have been transferred to the state. So you're right about that. However, Christian and uh, Jewish Waqf has also been liquidated by the state of Israel. They consider it an archaic institution that has been abolished. Uh, apparently with the connivance of the Orthodox, uh, with the religious authorities. Uh, they have not been able to do that with Christian uh, Waqf institutions because the Vatican, Moscow, and uh, Athens are there uh, to, to prevent it. And because it also has to do with reciprocal Jewish properties in, in outside the state of Israel. In the West Bank, they also have not been able or in Jerusalem, they have not been able to touch waqf property in a similar manner. So you could say that what happened in Israel is null and void. And in fact, it has been contested in courts. And in, in few cases, the issues have been reversed. So the force of law is meaningful in this case. Usually to make, s is this working? Usually to make something like that work, you need some consideration, you need some compensation of the previous owners, which if they're unwilling to accept, becomes kind of uh, a bit complicated. So I wonder in, in Israel, have they managed uh, to uh, compensate someone so as to buttress their position? Uh, you mean, have they been able to liquidate what property in return for monetary remuneration? That's not legal. You cannot actually buy a waqf property even if you pay high remuneration. There are tricks in the code book which allows you to circumvent the waqf. One is long-term leases. And you hope after 99 years that everybody will be dead, don't remember <laughs> what happened. Mm -hmm. And long-term lease, of course, has weight because in, in the case of family uh, endowments that have been leased, um, for example, the Khalidi family has huge properties in the old city, which it leases to uh, merchants and other uh, interested parties for long terms. They tend to be renewed if it's done for 25 years, 49 years, 99 years. They tend to be renewed if the descendants are still around. The other way is to do outright confiscation and give a replacement property for that. They have done that, but in a very limited number of cases. The third uh, uh, way of dealing with it has been uh, outright seizure for security reasons. And of course, as you know, this is something that has been contested, but there is very little you can do when a military power comes and seizes something for security reasons. It becomes a overall epitaph for uh, doing anything you want. But even that, I, I should say that um, with the thirst by the State of Israel and settler groups to take property, they have been very careful in handling waqf uh, establishments. What does the Orthodox Church do with all that land that it has? How is it utilized? Well, um, most, uh, in the case of the Orthodox, most urban uh, waqf establishments are leased for commercial reasons. So you can have schools, you can have uh, dispensaries, hospitals, uh, and so on. There are few cases where uh, the waqf property are 
a big commercial establishment like hotels. Um, Hamid Dejan is here, I saw him. Did he go? Ah, uh, this is a case with the Imperial Hotel, I think. In Jaffa Gate, so Hamid can talk about this because it's been in his family's administration and control for many years. I think it costs them money to have it. Yeah. <laughs> you pay nominal rent, which is uh, by contract, and then you use it as whatever is a dispenser or hotel and so on. Yeah, uh, the, the point that uh, Dr. Dajani is saying is that although the rent has been nominal for decades, and in some cases centuries, the recent changes in law allow the, the tenant or the, uh, the user of the waqf to raise the, to the rent into more a market uh, level. So all of a sudden, waqf property now has become viable in, in commercial terms. No, no, the Israelis do not raise the rent. The Israelis allow market ah. value to be charged by the owner. So if it's the Orthodox Church, they're the ones who get the increase. Yeah, whoever is in control of the waqf can raise the rent, whereas before you have protected tenancies. This is no longer the case. You know, if you live in the Middle East as a whole, there are horror stories of people living, or not horror, sometimes they're good stories. <laughs> You live in the same house for three generations and you pay $5 a month for forever. And it cannot be changed. So this is the situation which has changed now. Yeah. Yes. Um, I see that there is, as I, this division, there was a city there that was made out of these people that happen to have these religions and play together and, and enjoy together. So it was a loss for these people regardless of, uh, of their religion. How the artists, uh, if there's still something in there, the artists, um, cinema, poetry, songs, that talk about that loss, that is not the loss of the palace, that is not of the Muslims, it's not the loss of the Christians and Israel, but of the people that have this other environment of unity. Is there any other expressions in poetry regarding this, this aspect of them as citizens, not as religious members of anything? You're asking me how do artistic people articulate I, uh, yes. the situation? Yeah, uh, as, as themselves, not as, as I am a, are, I'm a Muslim that I'm suffering from the Jewish, uh, you know, or from the Christian, or I'm a person from here that is suffering from all this. That, that is the point. Well, uh, in the case of our man, Watsu Juhari was a musician. Mm -hmm. So much of his narrative is permeated with musical discourse about what was happening in the city. And he was actually articulating a joie de vivre in a war situation. And actually, I, I'm glad you asked this question because one of the most famous pieces he ever wrote, he was not a great musician, but he was a popular musician, is called, um, what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> it's called uh, Kebab. It, it's a story about the famine of 1915-1916. It was a famine because the locusts attack and the army had sequestered all the grain supplies. So he wrote a, a piece of music called Kebab. And he recalled all the famous Jerusalem uh, foods, some of which are outside now, which I've been denied from because I'm talking and you've been partaking. 
he listed all the Manasseh and the shawarmas and the mahashis. So Jerusalem is a city of stuffings. <laughs> and because they stuff everything. <laughs> they stuff potatoes, they stuff cucumbers. Uh, what else did they stuff? <laughs> Tomatoes. Yeah, they also roll things. So it's it's the city of that's why why we call our book Medina al Mahashi. So he wrote a book, a, a, a song which lists all the missing food items, which makes your mouth water. And in the war, it became almost a national anthem. People were singing it all the time, recalling the missing foods. So this is Wasif, of course. And his music was a weapon of satire, combat, and recalling the good old days, which in his case was the the days of the peaceful pre-Ottoman uh, Ottoman pre uh, period. So that tradition was continued actually after uh, after 48 when he became uh, a performer in Beirut uh, radio as a musician and performer. And many of his music is, is, is still available from that period. And he, that tradition is still carried in Palestine and elsewhere, but now it's taking a more combative, uh, recollecting, melancholic uh, manner than, and less satirical than the one that, yeah. I don't, is, is this what you were asking me about? Yeah, I want to know how the, the people disconnected, like I'm, I'm a Palestinian, and I'm from Israel, and I should be like ah, the so. side. Yeah. So there are people that are like, yeah, what yeah. They did there. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, you, they do. Well, uh, in Juhari's book, which um, has been reduced in English, but, but the Arabic version has a CD at the end which contains all the music. It's very interesting because it contains music performed by Jews, Christians, and Muslims for the celebration of the other. Like there are Christian songs for Ramadan. There are Muslim songs in Purim. There are Jewish, I don't know the song, but there are Jewish enchant, in, incantations for Sabtin Nur, which are listed by, by Johari. And it's so interesting that these things have totally disappeared now. This syncretic, mutual kind of partaking in the celebration of the other. Dr. Tamari, uh, part of your title was the mundane. Uh, my question is very mundane. Previous speaker here said that Jerusalem is more segregated than even Detroit. The polls I have read, this is Arab and Jews and Christians really don't like each other. Could you comment on that? Well, uh, more than Detroit, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this new revived Detroit. <laughs> uh, well, it is segregated because the lines separating the armistice of 1949, which is the Route 1, actually divides uh, ethnically the uh, Jewish city from the Arab city. And the Arab habitat of, uh, of West Jerusalem have been all kicked out to the other side, and the Jews from the old city have been kicked out. But now we have the settlers. We have a huge number of settlements surrounding Jerusalem, in Gilo, in Nevi Yaakov, uh, uh, French Hill, which have actually made the segmental form of segregation. It's not zones segregating Arabs from Jews, but it's segmented colonies within the Arab city. And on the Jewish side, you can't see any Arab. It's, it's, you, you, it's very difficult to rent. Uh, first, if you're from the West Bank, you cannot even go there as a visitor. You can't even look at it. But if you're an Arab with an Israeli ID or a, a Jerusalem ID, you cannot rent or buy houses in the Western city. The law, the Israeli law, is that you had to be a member of a state which was not at war with the state of Israel when the war happened in 48. So if you're, let's say, a, a citizen of Belgium or the US or Canada in 48, then you can claim your property back. There are three families who made such claims. 
One of them was successful, the others two not, because they put on them back taxes to reclaim these properties, which were uh, unimaginable. And you had to be a member of that, citizen of that country, in 48, not after. You can't be an American and make a claim. So it's a kind of catch-22 for, for these claims. And the segregation actually is quite strong, which you will see when you go there. Yes. Uh, Dr. Stalin, thank you very much for the interesting uh, presentation. My name is Mohammed. Uh, I'm Palestinian from Nablus. And um, well, as you know, we, uh, in Nablus, we've been always jealous from Jerusalem. Um, you know, last time I introduced myself as a Palestinian uh, was two days ago during an event with um, former Israeli ambassador, his name is uh, Yoram. And uh, where during his presentation, he was trying to make sure that, uh, to, um, uh, to assure the point that Jerusalem is an Israeli state and it's been always uh, like, uh, sorry, uh, Jerusalem is an Israeli capital and it will be the Israeli capital forever. And um, so that, I know you are not politician, but my question is, ev like at, at some point everybody was looking at Jerusalem as one of the main obstacles uh, and in front of making peace in Palestine and Israel. Do you in any way see it as a reason to have or to make peace, like a supportive reason instead of being an obstacle in front of making peace? Because you were talking about uh, the old city and I believe all the numbers you mentioned was about the old city, not the whole uh, city. And we're talking about one kilometer with five uh, sections, the four um, neighborhoods, and also the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. So that's a very complicated situation. You know, people here ask me, what do you think of Jerusalem? And I can't see how it could be part of the solution. We see it always as part, or as, as a problem, not as part of the solution. Do you see it as part of the solution in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Thank you. You, you want me to share your pessimism? Is this <laughs> <a shame? laughs> I mean, we have plenty of that. <laughs> uh, you're right, you're very right about the discussion being confined to the old city is a bit uh, deceptive because Jerusalem is much bigger than the square kilometers. This is the sacred a territory uh, that uh, is within the city walls. So it's much bigger, and there's not only the western part, but all the suburbs in Silwan, Tour, Sheikh Jarrah, northern suburbs, and the southern suburbs, which are uh, much bigger in size than, and in, in terms of population than the area of the one square kilometer. Now, there are two solutions, I think. and. I am very uh, optimistic that one of them will happen, maybe two. First one is I don't think Israelis can continue to treat uh, Jerusalem as if it was uh, a, a juridical issue of conquest and we, you know, shit happens, the war came, we won, and then you have to deal with that situation, which is there basically their position and all the mumbo jumbo about the eternal capital of the state of Israel, which uh, has been undermined by many other uh, claims to many cities in the world, including the city of Jerusalem, which has gone through many <coughs> dynastic kind of rules. So the, the issue here is that they cannot have their cake and eat it because the cake in this case is demography and eating it will make them choke if they continue chewing on such a big bite. And that's why they have to deal with the issue of demography uh, in, a, in a creative way. And they have been dealing through zoning and uh, residency permits. Still, the Arabs are, the Palestinian Arabs, one third and increasing in, in proportion in that city. So they, they have not been able to solve it through these means. So that moves to the second solution, which is to create conditions where people will give up their sovereign claims by virtue of making life subject to market regulation. 
or by creating administrative units that will give equality of residence to everybody. This is what happened in Berlin. Berlin, I mean, the East German uh, um, city was simply uh, integrated and under West German law, but everybody actually was given constitutional rights of equality, so it works. And if the issue of demography and zoning does not work in the first place, compulsion, both international and native, will be so much to uh, synthesize, to, uh, to assimilate the population within the body politic of the Jerusalem city administration and the state of Israel. Now, what's interesting about this, it's a possibility, and everybody who calls for binationalism knows that it's a utopian vision, but it has it happened before somewhere else. But what's most interesting about it is that the Israelis are more scared of it than if they cede territorially the Arab city to the Palestinians. So the scare of the Berlin possibility, I think, may yield to the first solution of uh, sovereignty. At the moment, the pressure is not very high because Israel can have the cake and eat it. But this is very unlikely to continue uh, uh, given international uh, 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 isolation. The fact that you cannot deal with a huge territory with a disenfranchised population in the 21st century under colonial conditions. Uh, it, ha it has happened actually because, particularly because the U.S. has lent its weight, at least negatively, to these uh, violations of Israeli um, uh, administrative action on Jerusalem and the Palestinian territories. But how long would this con continue? Uh, this is, may not be the answer you, you were hoping, but that's my answer to you. Thank you. Thank you.